Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesteke, and this is The Limiting Factor. The results are finally in. The Tesla 4680 cell has a nominal energy density of 244 watt-hours per kilogram, compared to the roughly 269 watt-hours per kilogram seen in Panasonic 2170 cells sourced from Giga Nevada. When adjusted for the differing design of each cell, these cells are roughly on par. And when Tesla starts using silicon in the 4680, it should pull ahead. However, clearly there's more variables than that and more to the story. So today, I'm going to walk you through the data provided by UC San Diego so you can better understand the results. Then, to round things out, I'll give my take on the speculation that the 4680 Model Y from Giga Texas may offer a range upgrade through software in the future, why the vehicle is so heavy, and why energy density isn't Tesla's top priority. I'd like to say thank you to the people who made this video possible. Shirley Mung organized funding for the cell testing as the Zabel Endowed Chair in Energy Technologies in Jacobs School of Engineering. Additionally, Y. Kong Lee spent quite a bit of time testing the cell and answering my questions. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors. As always, the links for support are in the description. Unlike the first 4680 I tore down, which was a scrap battery cell, this battery cell came from a production Model Y from Texas. I bought the cell from Monroe and Associates for $800 with funding provided by my Patreon supporters. Notably, as fate would have it, the battery pack had 420 miles on it. So, this cell is as close as we're going to get to a battery cell straight from the factory. Monroe and Associates used a dry ice blasting technique to extract the 4680s from the pack. As we'll see when we look at the capacity of the Austin Model Y pack, it doesn't appear this had an effect on cell performance. But if you know of any research that might point to the contrary, let me know in the comments below. The cell I received only had slight damage. The positive terminal was warped, and that probably happened when the current collector was pried off to pop the weld free. This wouldn't have noticeably affected the results. Electrical connections typically work, or they don't. Let's start working through the slide deck from UC San Diego. The first question people will likely have is, are there any physical differences between this cell and the cell that was torn down a few months ago? The answer is no. However, the first cell was at 0.13 volts and couldn't be tested because it was never run through the final steps of the manufacturing process. The cell from Monroe was at 3.52 volts, or about a 20-25% to state of charge. I confirmed with the team at Monroe that it was never discharged below 3 volts before it was shipped to UC San Diego for testing, despite a comment in a Monroe YouTube video that it had been deep discharged. On screen are two electrochemical performance tests. The test on the left is for energy density, and the test on the right is for rate performance. Rate performance tests how a cell performs at high power output. Notice that the voltage range is slightly different for each test. The voltage range for the energy density test is wider, at 2.5 to 4.3 volts. This is to maximize the amount of energy extracted from the cell to give the best possible indication of energy density, or nominal energy. The voltage range for the rate performance is narrower, from 3 to 4.2 volts. This is because 3 to 4.2 volts is the voltage range that lithium-ion battery cells typically operate in. It's typical because despite reducing the amount of energy extracted, it results in slower degradation because the cell isn't being pushed to the 2.5 and 4.3 volt extremes. It's a trade-off decision between energy and cycle life. The energy density graph shows 23.35 amp hours of nominal capacity, whereas at the same discharge rate, the rate performance graph shows 22.03 amp hours of what we could consider usable energy. With that information in hand, along with the voltage and weight measurements, the nominal energy density of the 4680 is 244 watt-hours per kilogram, and the usable energy density is 230 watt-hours per kilogram. To benchmark the 4680, I've also included two 2170 cells, a Panasonic 2170 that's used in long-range U.S. Teslas, and an LG 2170 that was used in long-range Chinese Teslas in 2021 and 2022. 
The Panasonic 2170 specs are from publicly available information, and the LG 2170 specs are from UC San Diego, which was tested using the same protocols as the 4680. As a side note, long-range Teslas in China that use 2170 cells are now using a newer chemistry that contains less cobalt. The performance of those cells is probably much closer to the Panasonic cells. As you can see, the Tesla 4680 has the lowest energy density. The LG Chem 2170 comes in second, and the Panasonic 2170 comes in first. However, this isn't an apples-to-apples -apples comparison because each of these cells use different designs and chemistries. Let's adjust for that. The Tablas Electrode provides the 4680 with up to a 1% energy density increase by reducing the internal resistance of the cell. I view this as a maximum figure because although the resistance is lower for the 4680 by two-thirds, it's pumping out a lot more current. I was expecting lower resistance, but 7 ohms is a good result for the 4680. With that said, the measurement here should be taken with a grain of salt because as cell size increases, measuring resistance becomes trickier. That is, to arrive at a more accurate figure, it might take a dedicated video and more measurements. So the maximum of 1% energy improvement will have to suffice for today. Moving along to cathode thickness, the 4680 cell has about a 2-3% to advantage in energy density here thanks to a thicker cathode. If you'd like to know more about this, watch my Revolutions Aren't Easy video. To summarize, the thicker cathode in the 4680 resulted in a 15% increase in cathode capacity. If you're wondering why a 15% increase in cathode capacity from the thicker cathode only resulted in a 2-3% increase in capacity, it's because the cathode only makes up part of the battery cell. The impact of the thicker cathode is diluted by all the other materials in the cell, such as the current collectors, anode, and separator. As for can thickness, the 2170 cells have at least a 10% energy density advantage thanks to their lighter weight, thinner cell cans. The cell cans of the 2170 cells are thinner because they're non-structural cells. The 4680, on the other hand, uses the cell can as structure for the vehicle. So, Tesla made the can thicker to provide rigidity. Finally, the Panasonic 2170 gets a 5-10% to energy density bump by using silicon in the anode, which stores about 9 times the lithium that graphite does per unit of weight. As confirmed by UC San Diego, the LG cell and 4680 cell do not use silicon. If we adjust for all these variables by giving each cell all the advantages of all the other cells, we can see that all the cells are roughly on par, with the 4680 having greater potential energy density when it starts using even a small amount of silicon. This is a useful thought exercise because it shows that all these battery cells are relatively on par if we level the playing field in terms of energy density. But, in reality, the playing field isn't level because energy density isn't the biggest priority for cell makers. Over time, I expect the 4680 will come to dominate the 2170 for the electric vehicle market because it's the superior choice for driving down costs, reducing part count, and increasing line speed. As long as it can hit a similar energy density after factoring in the can thickness, it's the clear choice for cost and scaling. If you'd like to know more about that, check out my What Matters video. With that said, although many companies will make a cell with a 4680 form factor, I don't expect them to adopt all the technologies that Tesla's implementing in their version of the 4680. At least not yet. Let's look at each technology, starting with the Tablas Electrode. It's likely that Tesla will be the only company using a Tablas Electrode. As CleanerWatt reported, Panasonic intends to use a 5-tab design instead. My guess is that LG Chem will follow suit. A 5-tab design will provide performance nearly as good as the Tesla cell, but welding the tabs will reduce the speed of the cell manufacturing line and increase manufacturing cost. As for cathode thickness, LG Chem and Panasonic will both work towards thicker electrodes, but I expect them to use a wet process rather than a dry process. A wet process will provide performance on par with Tesla cells, but will hold back manufacturing speed because wet coatings are slower because they require drying lines. As far as the thicker cell can and the use of silicon goes, for the most part, that's a design decision based on use case and what you're optimizing for and what the requirements of the cell are. So, at this point, it's not worth comparing here. Let's circle back to the slide deck from UC San Diego, because we took quite a detour to go down the energy density rabbit hole. 
The rate performance graph shows that the cell retained 90.7% of its capacity at a 1-hour discharge rate compared to a 10-hour discharge rate. Battery cells lose capacity at higher discharge rates because, amongst other factors, there's a limit to the speed that ions can flow in a battery cell. Faster discharge rates run up against those limits. 90.7% is comparable to other battery cells on the market, but it's not a figure to get hung up on because Tesla needs energy density more than it needs a battery that can fully discharge with high capacity in an hour. This brings us to Tesla's claim on battery day, about six times the power for a cell that's five times the size and energy. That is, about a 1.2 times power increase. Where did Tesla get the six times figure? I'm assuming what Tesla was referring to there was peak discharge power. To run a test like that, you need a rig that can handle at least 70 amps for a 4680 cell. The UC San Diego rig was only capable of 50 amps per channel, so a different rig would have been required to run the peak discharge power test. I'm still looking into how I can get that data, and I'll do another video if I have success. Regardless, Tesla already gets plenty of peak power out of their cells, and the limiting factor for acceleration in their high-performance vehicles is traction. So ultimately, it's not critical information. I'm sure people are also wondering about the cycling data. To do a proper cycling test, it could take up to eight months, so I decided against that. As with the power data, I may be able to get my hands on cycling data. If or when I do, I'll share it. As for physical characterization, the cathode is the same thickness as the last cell we tore down. It's also the same composition. We do see some variability of the ratio between elements here, but that's to be expected with a small sample area. Next, as I showed earlier, we now have a visual reference for how much thicker the cathode is in the 4680 cell compared to a typical 2170 cell. As I've said in past videos, there are ways to do this with a wet process, but it's slower than a dry process. Interestingly, even though both the 4680 and 2170 cells use an NMC811 cathode, you can see that the ratios are significantly different on each cell. The Tesla cell uses much more cobalt and less nickel, which is an area where Tesla will need to improve in the future. Cobalt is lower energy density than nickel, more expensive, and carries more public relations risks. So, for the time being, LG is doing quite a bit better here. As for the anode, it's also the same thickness as the anode from the last 4680. And again, as you can see, it contains no silicon. Finally, just like the last 4680, this cell is still using a dry coating for the anode because it's still showing the spider silk-like filaments to bind the electrode together. On that note, the cathode still isn't using a dry coating as of May or June 2022. I'm hoping that someone asks about the dry coating for the cathode at the next earnings call, because it may have a significant impact on Tesla's ability to scale 4680 production in 2023. This leaves us with one thing left to cover. As Pierre Farragou pointed out in the Q2 earnings call, there was intense speculation on Twitter that the Model Y from Texas, which uses 4680 battery cells, may be range-locked by software, and that extra range might be unlocked in the future. As Tesla economist and CleanerWatt pointed out in their videos on the topic, the idea was that the vehicle is too heavy and that based on the apparent capacity of the cell from several sources, including my video, that the pack should have more capacity. Until now, I was open to that idea. But let's look at this with fresh eyes now that we have test data from the 4680. As per UC San Diego, we know that each cell has a nominal rating of 86.5 watt-hours and a usable rating of 81.5 watt-hours. We also know from the Giga Austin event that the Model Y contains 12 strings of cells with 69 cells in each string, for a total of 828 cells in the pack. This means the pack has a nominal rating of 71.6 kilowatt hours and a usable rating of 67.5 kilowatt hours. 67.5 kilowatt hours is exactly what people are finding when they use the Tessie app. With that in mind, it doesn't appear that Tesla's holding range back for lighter sale. But as CleanerWatt points out, then why is the 4680 Model Y from Texas so heavy? It's because this is the first generation of the Tesla 4680 battery pack and the Giga castings. Elon and Drew have said that they'd only give the 4680 structural pack in the Model Y a C grade, and the Giga castings a C plus grade. I'd add that I don't think they're including the battery chemistry here. I'd say that compared to Tesla's roadmap, the chemistry in the current 4680 would probably get a D grade. That is, there's room to cut a lot of mass over time. 
To increase range by 14%, the 10% mass reduction would have to be at the vehicle level, or close to 200 kilograms. Obviously, that amount of progress isn't going to happen anytime soon. In my view, probably the mid to late 2020s to fully realize the benefits of the new architecture. Why didn't Tesla wait until the technology was mature before putting it into vehicles? Despite the additional heft, even this first generation of Giga Castings and Structural Pack in the Austin Model Y will be cheaper to produce and easier to scale than a Model Y using 2170 cells and no Giga Castings. That is, although cutting weight and increasing energy density are an important measure of Tesla's progress, they're technical specs rather than economic specs. Tesla could have perfected the structural pack and giga castings before putting them into vehicles, but why do that if they can save money today? Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. The technical specs should follow suit in the next few years as Tesla moves from making the new technologies work and making some initial economic gains to optimizing them. In a sense, it's a self-subsidizing model where the R&D is paying for itself. So all around, although we'd like to see Tesla deliver more quickly on the specs of the optimized version of the structural pack and giga castings they showed us at battery day, the cost and scaling targets are clearly what's more important here. As a final note, how is the estimate I provided in the first teardown video so far off? I said from 272 to 296 watt hours per kilogram, and what we got was 244 watt hours per kilogram. First, it's worth noting I said that the lower end of the range was more likely based on the conversations I had with other people in the field. I also stated that the range was calculated rather than actual, which is where the rub is. The energy density estimation from UC San Diego was a rough theoretical value rather than a fully modeled battery cell. Plus, there were gaps in the information that we were able to extract from the battery cell. However, a shout out to Matt Lacey, who used the data from my first 4680 teardown video to obtain a more accurate estimate through battery modeling. He used a couple of decades of knowledge and experience to push around the parameters in the battery model to refine the energy density estimate. That is, there are levels to the battery modeling game. If I run into the same situation again in the future, I now have a better idea of what's required to get an accurate estimate. In summary, although the energy density of the current generation of the 4680 cell isn't as high as expected, it's still a solid performer. If we simply strip out the extra thick cell can that provides the additional structure, it actually has nearly identical performance to the Panasonic 2170 cells. This is the benefit of using a larger cell with a greater internal volume to surface area ratio, a tabless electrode, and a thicker cathode. Although it would have been satisfying to see Tesla implement more of the chemistry improvements they showed us on battery day, it's not the priority. The priority is getting the 4680 lines up and running to build scale and drive down costs. I'm expecting to get more information on the 4680 cell in the coming weeks and months, such as whether the anode is natural or synthetic, and as I get more information, I'll share it with you. In the next video, I'll be comparing the BYD Blade, CATL Qi Lean, and Tesla 4680 battery packs. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video, or as a YouTube member. You can find the details in the description. A special thanks to my YouTube members and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all of your support, and thanks for tuning in.